Hey everyone, today we're going to spend some time talking about where kidney stones get stuck. This is a common question that comes up and it's a source of tremendous anxiety for a lot of people who are either new to passing kidney stones or even if you've passed kidney stones for your entire life. That stone getting stuck strikes instant fear into people's hearts. And today I want to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about what leads to a stone getting stuck, where are the most common sites that this getting stuck can occur? What are some of the symptoms we should be looking for uh, when we're listening to our bodies if we're trying to pass a kidney stone naturally? And then lastly, what are some of the things that we can do either once a stone gets stuck or um, while we're passing this stone in order to provide us with the best possible platform for passing this kidney stone with as few issues as we possibly can? So let's dive in. The first thing I want to chat about is just why, you know, what are some of the reasons that kidney stones get stuck? So first and foremost, the shape of the stone is going to play a very, very big part of uh, its navigation through your urinary tract. Some of the stones, the most common type of kidney stone is a calcium oxalate monohydrate stone. And those are very round, sometimes oval shaped and very, very dense. Those stones have a they're typically, they slide through the urinary tract pretty easy. There are other types of stones though that are very misshapen and some of them even are jagged and pointy uh, and kind of uh, the way I think about it is like it's Velcro to the inside of your urinary tract and the really sensitive and soft uh, type of uh, flesh that's inside there and they like to grab on and stick like that hook and loop Velcro and it makes it difficult for them to pass. So shape is a very, very large determinant of whether or not a kidney stone will pass smoothly or not. Next, it's size. This makes total sense. Smaller the stone, it's gonna uh, navigate that urinary tract a little bit easier. The larger the stone, there's potentially more challenges at hand. On that note though, I wanna take a second. You know, when we're looking at the internal diameter of your, your reader, that is the tube that leads from the kidney, to the bladder where your kidney stone is gonna spend probably the most time during its passage, that internal diameter is four to five millimeters. And that might not sound like a lot to most people, but it is pretty generous. And that your reader has the ability to expand and contract as it sees fit to handle urine volume. And in this particular instance, a stone. So when you're considering whether or not you can pass a kidney stone naturally without surgery, really what you're looking for, and we have a video, I'm going to link the card up to it here, but the measurement that you're most often given by your doctor or your urologist is the length of the stone. And this is because they are using ultrasounds or x-rays. Those are kind of the most common uh, type of imaging technique that are using, and that is two-dimensional. They get oftentimes just the length, and then maybe a width type of dimension, but the length is the scariest. So you might have a nine millimeter kidney stone, that is the length, but that is not the most important dimension in this consideration. We are interested in the diameter of the stone because the diameter of the stone is really what's gonna dictate whether or not this thing can pass or not. Now, a stone passed a certain length, <laughs> like if it were 15 millimeters, that's gonna provide challenges for you passing, but most of them aren't over a centimeter in length that we're talking about passing naturally here. But the one that we're looking at, again, the key, diam it's the key metric is the diameter. So you are able to obtain this if your doctor or your urologist performed a CT scan, which is a 3D model. This gives us the best possible information to be able to determine whether or not a stone is of a size that can pass. But Rest assured that most kidney stones that are labeled as under 10 millimeters are really internally, as far as diameter is concerned, more in the neighborhood of anywhere between four and six millimeters as far as their diameter or width, if we're looking at a 2D model, and they can pass. But as size gets bigger, it's obviously brushing up against the margins of that ureter, and it will slow things down and potentially cause more complications in terms of them the kidney stones getting stuck. Doesn't mean that it can't pass, but it might get stuck. So that's what we wanna talk about today. Next, the thing that's gonna be talked about most today is the natural narrowings that occur in the urinary tract, which is where almost all of those stones, regardless of size, get stuck and they trip people up. So when we're talking about those natural narrowings, there are really two major and one 
uh, kind of minor, I guess I'll call it, location in the urinary tract where those stones have a higher propensity of getting stuck. Again, regardless of their size, stones just typically get hung up here. So where are they? The first point, and we're going to break this down just to let you know, kind of in three different sections. First point is in the upper urinary tract. And where that is, is the, called the UPJ. That is the ureteropelvic junction. And that is really where the kidney empties into the ureter uh, and it flows down towards the bladder. So right about here, and this is the pelvis region, this is the bigger region here, but as it narrows down into the ureter, it's just a natural narrowing that occurs. Uh, almost everybody without fail has this natural narrowing. And that first little natural narrowing there is actually where, you know, when a kidney stone first releases, that first huge pang of pain, this is where that occurs. That is the, the first point where we go, oops, we have a problem. Next, this is kind of the way you can look about it is midway down the urinary tract. And this is actually not a a natural narrowing in the same sense as the UPJ, but it is a narrowing that is a result of some external pressure that is being exerted by the iliac vessels, or arteries rather, that flow blood down to the lower part of the body. So, crude drawing here again, but we have um, the uh, inferior vena cava, and then we also have the aorta here. And again, these are crossing over on both sides of the urinary tract, and as they pass over that ureter, they are applying some external pressure to it, which is causing an unnatural narrowing. Now, it's not a, uh, an actual narrowing like you would have up at the UPJ and then down at the UVJ, which we'll talk about here in a second, but there's pressure being applied to it, which kind of compresses down that tubule, which is the ureter, which can cause stones to get caught. Now, when we're looking at the lower part of the urinary tract, we are looking at the UVJ, which is called the ureterovesical junction. And this is where the ureter empties into the bladder. And again, this is a point where there is actually a narrowing of the internal diameter of your ureter. This occurs at those two points. And that's why I say that there are two major, the UPJ and the UVJ, and one minor, which is the where the, um, the iliac vessels cross over the ureter. It's also known as the ure ureteral crossing of the iliac vessels or the CUIV uh, for short. So there are really these three places. If you were to take a look and you did a, a, a like a study on where stones get caught up from most people and they start experiencing the renal colic pain again while they're passing a kidney stone, it's almost, I'd say 95% of the instances based on the research that's been done, it's going to happen at one of these three points, the upper, the mid, or the lower. Just keep that in mind. Now, when passing a kidney stone naturally, there are a number of things that we kind of need to keep in mind. We're uh, passing something that's not meant to be there. Now, the body has systems in place in order to, to manage that, but it's not a lot of fun. And if you've watched our video on renal colic, or if you've had a kidney stone, you know that pain, the renal colic pain, is out of this world. And it's something that you want to try to avoid. But we want to try to listen to our body when we're passing these kidney stones naturally because it can be telling us some things. So what are some of the symptoms that we should be looking out for that might signify that the stone is stuck? But again, it doesn't mean that it's a problem and we should panic. We just need to be cognizant of it. So one of the first things that people will realize is they go past this first initial like oh my God, insane pain, and then things calm down. The stone is making progress, or maybe it's hanging out. It's not stuck, but it's not moving. But as soon as a stone gets stuck, that means that it's at a place where it's starting to cause backup of urine into the kidney, which is what causes that kidney to swell and causes the renal colic pain that we've been talking about, that really intense, insane pain that is just out of this world, that is due to the stone being stuck and it's causing a little bit of a backup. Don't freak out though. Again, this backing up of urine, also known as hydronephrosis, is normal. If you've got a kidney stone, you have mild, sorry, you have mild hydronephrosis just like at a baseline. It's not impeding your kidney's ability to function uh, to any appreciable extent. Uh, urine flow is still good. It's just 
there's something in the way. <laughs> and that's what leads to this mild hydronephrosis. So you may see that when you get that back from your imaging, when you're talking to your urologist or your doctor, they might say mild hydronephrosis, this is normal. Um, and severe hydronephrosis is incredibly rare. I mean, these are like outlier type of situations that we're talking about. Most people, even if they have uh, even more, uh, a stronger type of hydronephrosis versus just the mild that we have, it's temporary. The body will correct some things and we can do some things to correct uh, the situation as we're gonna talk about here at the end, but it will it's temporary, it will pass. Even though there might be some pain, it will continue to pass. Now, when talking about hydronephrosis, so again, just by default, we've got mild hydronephrosis when we have a kidney stone. But if there is a severe or a stronger indication of hydronephrosis, what's really happening is here. So let's imagine that we have a kidney stone that is lodged somewhere in this ureter here. And this is a healthy kidney over here, and this is a kidney uh, that is representative of the swelling that occurs with hydronephrosis. So we have a blockage that's occurring here, and urine is starting to back up here. And you can see this uh, UPJ and the, the uh, renal pelvis here is enlarged and it's swollen because it's got urine that it can't pass. So it is blocking this and this swelling here is causing pain and it could potentially cause some other things uh, that we want to keep an eye out for. So if you have this happen, obviously you're going to notice that there's the pain, but you also might start to feel symptoms of nausea um, that you didn't have before uh, other than that initial insane pain after the stone just started to drop. Other things to look out for are fevers. If you have a fever, this is typically a sign that there might be an infection, and it's probably time to go seek some medical attention. But fevers uh, and infections are rare, very rare. Uh, so this is probably not something that you're gonna come across. And then next, another real big kind of telltale sign is if you start having difficulty or pain while urinating. This is typically a sign that there's some sort of blockage that's occurring that's restricting the flow. And again, it will resolve itself, but you should note in your head, oh, I've got a little bit of blockage going on and I probably need to do something about it in order to make it not have any long-term effects. Now, I want to note that there is a difference here because uh, sometimes stones will get stuck in your bladder and that is a completely different type of experience. When the stone is in the bladder and you start to urinate and then all of a sudden your, your stream goes from like powerful to trickle, 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 trickle to nothing, that's a different scenario. This with difficulty or painful urination, uh, when there's a stone in your ureter, you're just not going to be able to, to urinate. You're gonna have urine that may have been in your bladder, but you may not be able to urinate for hours, which is a problem. You might not feel like you have to urinate for hours. This is another one of those telltale signs that go, something's happening here, I might need to take some action. So just keep that in mind. Now, when we're talking about managing this, so one of the biggest things that anybody who's passing a kidney stone, it doesn't matter if you're looking to do this naturally or if you're going in for surgery uh, or you're having some other type of approach to passing this kidney stone, making sure that you're hydrated is of the utmost importance. Uh, as we've talked about in previous videos, you know, it's likely improper hydration that's led you to this point of getting a kidney stone. Um, and those habits oftentimes continue while you're trying to pass this kidney stone. Change that. You should be looking to drink about three to four liters of water a day, which is about 96 to 128 ounces of water every single day um, and break it out throughout the day, but stay hydrated. And kind of your litmus test for this is you want your urine to be clear to maybe just a slight yellow tinge. This will give you and your body the best possible foundation to be able to pass this kidney stone with as little issues as possible. Next, managing inflammation. And we've talked about this in a number of videos. I'm gonna link the one up to uh, renal colic up here. But managing inflammation during this process will also help your kidney stone have the best chance at moving through without issues because inflammation grips onto that kidney stone and prevents it from moving, which in, in turn can cause hydronephrosis. So we want to manage the inflammation as best as we can. Now, you could use a natural product such as ours, uh, which is Cleanse, uh, and there'll be a link for that in the show notes, or just like a Tylenol or acetaminophen uh, will also work in a pinch when you're trying to control inflammation while passing the kidney stone. Next, 
increasing urine production. This is a key one that a lot of people miss as well. So in order for that stone to move, there needs to be urine flowing over it. So we need to bump that up through the use of a diuretic. We like to use dandelion root tea. That's just our personal favorite, uh, but something like a water pill uh, that you can get from a pharmacy will also sufficiently meet those needs as long as you are increasing your hydration to fuel that as well. Then there's also another method which we came across on YouTube and I uh, can't link a card to it, but I will put it down in the show notes. This is like the, the jump and stomp method, uh, which is makes sense. So, you know, if you have a kidney stone that is uh, you know, giving you any of these type of symptoms after that initial bit of pain, you know, the jump and stomp method can be used for a couple different scenarios, but if it's in the ureter, and you could also use it for a stone that's stuck at the UVJ. Literally what you're doing is you're just kind of jumping and stomping and there's a physical force that you're exerting on your body, that jarring aspect is what can help reposition that kidney stone in your body and allow urine to start flowing back, the swelling to reduce in the kidneys and you'll have uh, the symptoms here that you were experiencing start to dwindle and then go away. Lastly, there's also the what I call or we call the pressure method. And this is, you know, really meant only for use if your stone is stuck at the UVJ or stuck in your bladder. And we've done a video on this and I will link a card to this that will tell you more about what you should be experiencing and what you might feel if it's stuck at the UVJ or in the bladder. But the pressure method is basically you're drinking a elevated amount of water, taking an elevated dose of an anti-inflammatory to help make sure the pathways are nice and clear and loose. And you're creating back pressure through urine to force that stone through that, that narrowing that occurs down at the UVJ. Don't use this method if you have a stone that is anywhere else farther up in your urinary tract. That additional water that you're drinking could potentially fuel uh, a more severe form of hydronephrosis, sorry, of hydronephrosis. Really only want to use this down here when you're just about to kind of cross that uh, last point mark, that last checkpoint when you're going to go into the bladder. That's really when you want to use it or when it's stuck in the bladder and you're looking to just push it past a little narrowing that occurs here as it flows from the bladder down into the urethra and out of your system. I hope that makes sense. If you have questions, please drop them below in the comment line. We do respond to all those questions and I want to make sure that this is crystal clear for uh, everybody that's watching because a kidney stone getting stuck, as I'd mentioned before, is one of the biggest fears of people who are passing a kidney stone naturally. And it doesn't need to be as long as we educate ourselves on what potentially could occur and what we can do to help mitigate those things. Thank you again for watching and we will see you guys again in the next video.